and that's started, please, via text. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Got it? Okay, there we go. All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to He's the Solution Ministries. My name is Lee Arnold. Glad to have you here with us this morning. We're going to be covering 2 Corinthians chapter 8. So if you would please open up your Bibles to 2 Corinthians. Open up your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And let's begin by reading through this verse together. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. And they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected. But they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. I'm commanding you. But I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that through though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here's my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first and only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Verse 11. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Our desire is not that others might be received while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. Verse 16, I thank God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he is coming to you with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. And we are sending along with him the brother who is praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel. What is more, he was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering, which we administer in order to honor the Lord himself and to show our eagerness to help. We want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift, for we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of men. Verse 22, in addition, we are sending with them our brother who has often proved to us in many ways that he is zealous, and now even more so because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker. Among you, as for our brothers, they are representatives of the churches and an honor to Christ. Therefore, show these men the proof of your love and the reason for our pride in you so that the churches can see it. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning as we open up your word, Lord, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Lord, you, uh, you know why we are here on this day, and you know why each person here has decided to join us today, both those live and those listening uh, after the fact, Lord. There's something here that you want to share with us, that you want us to know. Uh, that you want us to be reminded of, that you want us to see and understand. So Lord, I pray that you would just keep all of the, the distractions away. Uh, Lord, help the enemy not to win for our attention during the study. Lord, help us to be focused on your word. Help us to be focused on what you are conveying to us, what you are Im impressing upon us. And Lord, help us to be uh, excited uh, to listen 
and to learn and Lord, to make adjustments as you place on our heart, Lord, the, uh, the desire to do things differently. So Lord, I pray that you would just lead us this morning, give us wisdom, give us discernment. Lord, give us a heart to hear and to understand. Lord, more than anything, I pray that you'd help me to get out of the way. Uh, Lord, we're here to hear from you this morning. So Lord, speak to us now. We love you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. A wealthy man was once asked, how in the world did you become so rich when you give so much away? Well, he answered, the Lord shovels it in and I shovel it out and God has a bigger shovel. My friend, we could never outgive God. Chapters 8 and 9 give us the most extended and complete section on Christian living or Christian giving that we have in the scriptures. Actually, all we need is known, all we need to know is here. There are no rules, but there are certain clear cut principles for giving. The word that is important in this section is the word grace. The word grace occurs 10 times between chapters 8 and chapter 9, and the subject is the grace of giving. The passion of God to share all of his goodness with others. That's the definition of grace. The passion of God to share all his goodness with others. Grace means that God wants to bestow upon you good things, goodnesses, and he wants to make you fine, fine and noble, and he wants to bring you into the likeness of his son, which is why I have titled today's message, Generosity should make us giddy. Generosity should make us giddy. Now, at this point in the story, as Paul continues his letter to the Corinthian church, his second letter to the Corinthian church, uh, he's dealing with a situation where the church in Jerusalem is going through hard times financially. So this is the home church where Christianity is kind of been planted and it's now growing from there and the church in Jerusalem is going through some uh, going through a drought so they are struggling financially they are struggling uh, with just having their basic needs met uh, and Paul sees this as an opportunity for bonding between the Gentile Christians and the Jewish believers in Jerusalem so Paul is eager to complete the gift. So he's writing here in verse 1, and he says, And now, brother, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Now, Macedonia is located in present-day northern Greece, and Corinth is located in southern Greece. And Paul was hoping that the news of the generosity of these churches would encourage the Corinthian believers and motivate them to solve their problems and unite in fellowship. So Paul is bragging about the Macedonian churches because out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. So the churches to the north in, of Corinth, which were Thessalonica, Berea, and particularly Philippi, were going through tough times, yet they shared generously. Now, notice that the Macedonians gave out of their deep poverty. Uh, verse 2, out of the most severe trial is the reference to deep poverty, and their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. They didn't have riches, and they didn't give of their surplus or of their abundance. They gave out of their poverty. You know, I uh, every 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 week as I'm preparing for the Sundays, I, I go through commentary after commentary after commentary, and it was kind of a, a theme amongst all of the commentators that they were glad that God had called them to teach the Bible verse by verse, line by line, because if they weren't called to do that, uh, many of them cited that they would never preach on 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9. Why? Well, because this whole topic of giving 
amongst the Christian church has, it's, it's, it's a little bit rocky, right? Some people say that we need to be giving the tithe. Well, the tithe is 10%. Well, that's Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, yeah, the tithe was requirement to, you know, be in good standing with God. But post, uh, post-crucifixion post resurrection, we're no longer under law. We're now under grace. And under grace, we can give as much or as little as our heart desires. And that's the main point here. What does the heart desire to give? Because God loves a cheerful giver. So if we are not giving in cheerfulness, then we are giving out of grudgingness. And God does not like a grudgingly giver. So to preach on this, especially I can imagine at the church level, you know, if I'm the pastor of a church and I'm standing in front of my congregation and I'm, I'm having to exhort them to give or to not give or to give till it hurts or to give till the joy stops. And so I could see how that would be somewhat uncomfortable as a pastor. But I think for all of us as students of the Bible, we need to understand kind of some of the rules as it relates to giving and what is the right. It's, and it's not the right amount because that's between you and the Lord. It is the right heart to give. So that's the underlying theme now as we're going through this is what is God's call on you personally, you individually, because under grace, there is no tithe requirement. However, when we give, we are exercising our, our gifts within the Holy Spirit with, uh, as, or, as somebody having a relationship with Jesus Christ that wants to advance his kingdom and wants to invest in kingdom work. Now, an investment into kingdom work is tithing to your church. And again, we use that word tithing so freely, but the root word of tithe is 10, which is the representation of 10%. So this is what everybody gets, gets stuck in. Uh, I got to get 10%. Well, okay, let's talk about the entrepreneurs in the room. Because I know many an entrepreneur who, if you look at their tax returns, they don't make any money. You know, they might have a couple hundred thousand dollars come in, but by the time they file their taxes, at the end of it all, after they take all of their write-offs, depreciation, and everything else that you get to do as a business owner, uh, their bottom line is that they don't pay any taxes. Or, and as a result, they didn't make any money. So, Lord, how can I tithe what I don't have? Well, Based on our study today, you will see that the person who thinks like that will not be blessed abundantly, period, end of statement, because they have all they need, uh, and they're not sharing any of it with God. And so we have to be looking not at what our tax says, looking at what the Lord says and what he's done individually. And what we are called to give and what we're prompted to give willfully, cheerfully, out of not just our abundance, but out of our all. Now, Paul, during his missionary journey, had collected money for the impoverished believers in Jerusalem. And the churches in Macedonia, Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea had given money even though they were poor. And they had given more than Paul expected. And this was sacrificial giving because they were poor themselves, but they wanted to help. The point of giving is not so much the amount we give, but it's the why and the how we give. God does not want gifts given grudgingly. Instead, he wants us to give as this church did out of dedication to Christ's love for fellow believers, the joy of helping those in need as well as the fact that it was simply the good and right thing to do. So here's the question. How well does your giving measure up to the standards set by the Macedonian churches? Verse 3, For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own 
They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints, and they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. They did not give out of their abundance. They gave out of their poverty. You know, I remember when I was, I was in fifth grade, my dad had uh, lost his job after 19 and a half years. And this is in the early 80s. And we were not doing very well financially. Dad was the uh, sole breadwinner. Uh, mom was a stay-at-home mom. And so when he lost his job, you know, they started on the savings and eventually that ran out. And if you remember the early 80s, this was not a great time for jobs. And my dad has always been in human resources. So he, he needed a company that needed a human resources director. So the search went on and on and on and eventually the money ran out. And I remember getting boxes of food on our front porch. I remember one time this family came over and they had this tin and inside the tin were dollar bills and coins and spare change. And they, they handed it, presented it to mom and dad, you know, like this. And mom and dad were like, what in the world is this? And they said, well, you know, our tradition has always been to go out for ice cream after Bible study on Wednesday night. And we thought, you know, why don't we put the ice cream money in this tin and let's give it to Linda and Larry and let's bless them with that. And, you know, I never forgot the heart of giving in that, in that period. And it was hard. Uh, you know, as a dad now, I can't imagine what it was like for my father right? Because as, as the dad, we are called to be the provider and to take care of the family and to feed them. And to not be able to do that had to be an incredibly humbling experience. But for me as a kid, seeing the generosity from the church and the church stepping up to take care of us was, uh, it was, it was amazing. You know, I think about that now, what impact are we having on other families in our own church fellowship? What are we doing to minister to those in our church family that are struggling and hurting, that aren't doing well? And the tendency is to say, well, I'm not doing very well either. So, you know, I want to help, but I, I just can't. There's, there's not much there. Well, if there's not much there, there's still something there because you didn't say there's nothing there. You just said there's not much there. All right. Well, there's still something there to give. Also, are you supporting your church? Are you supporting the ministries that support you? Uh, Paul writes in Galatians chapter 6, verse 6, he says, the one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. That literally means pay the preacher. It means, my friend, that you ought to support the work from which you derive a spiritual blessing. Are you supporting your local church? Are you supporting He's the Solution Ministries? Are you supporting the, the areas financially? Because if you are not, but only if there's joy in that. Giving should be out of the abundance of joy. We are never to give reluctantly or because we think we ought to give. We should be kind to give so that the word of God can reach others. It has been said when it comes to giving, some people stop at nothing. And unfortunately, that is where a great many people stop at nothing. Now, whether or not you think that your church needs the money, whether or not you think that particular ministry needs the money, it's not about what their needs are. It's about what God has called you to be doing. And if you're not supporting your local ministry, your local church fellowship financially, you need to do that. Well, I support them in other ways. Okay, well, that's, that's great too, but we're all called to support and give financially as well. So if we're not doing that, why aren't we doing that? The kingdom of God spreads through believers' concern and eagerness to help others. 
Here we see several churches joining to help others beyond their own circle of friends and their own city. You know, it's interesting because if you go to a restaurant and you sit down and they hand you the menus and you order and, you know, the server comes and fills your water glasses and, and serves you. And then the chef in the back, you know, cooks up whatever you've ordered and they come and they put it on your plate, uh, put it in front of you and you eat it and you get done and you feel fulfilled and, oh, that was fantastic, Lord, thank you for the great meal. And then when it's all said and done, you pay for your meal. You go to the mall, you go to a store, you go online, you, you purchase something that will bring value, something that will bring joy, something that will bring uh, a much needed result, and you pay for that thing. Why is it that we just assume that we can show up at church and leave and get what we need without leaving what they need? Doesn't make any sense. So why do we treat the world's economy so much different than God's economy? You know, we, we will, as, as, as Christians, you know, we are humans. We are called to be stewards of the income that we've given, that we've been given. And our jobs are from God. The opportunities that we have are from God. The, the real estate investment opportunities that we have come from God. Everything that we have and are is a blessing from God. So we will agree, we'll sign a, a promissory note for, to make a, a $1,200 a month payment for the next 360 months to pay for our mortgage. Uh, we will sign on the dotted line for a $350 a month payment for the next 72 months for our automobile. And we will sign on the dotted line for, you know, the monthly extraction out of our bank account for insurance and life insurance. And we'll send a check every month for our utility bills to keep the lights on and the heat on. But have we budgeted for our contributions to the ministry? Have we made commitments to the ministry? Have we said, okay, Lord, out of every two weeks, uh, out of my paycheck, every two weeks, I'm going to commit to give X. Have we done that? Is, is tithing and giving a part of your monthly line item expense budget? You know, Dave Ramsey fans, save 10, give 10, uh, save 10, tithe 10, uh, share 10. No, I, that's what it is. You can tell I'm not the world's best Dave Ramsey guy. Uh, but I know that he's big on saving and on tithing, making sure that we are being faithful with the tithe. But my point here is tithing needs to be intentional. Tithing needs to be pre-thought, not at the last minute as we're standing in church and they suddenly start passing the basket and we think, uh-oh, here it comes. I better see what I got. And we reach into our pocket and we pull out whatever loose change or spare dollar bills we got laying around. And that becomes the, the essence of our contribution for the week. No, no, that's not how it should be done. Now, again, I, I want to be careful here because <laughs> I am by no, I am in no means making a mandate. This is between you and the Lord. But some of you are, are hearing this for the first time. You've never actually even intended one of our services on a Sunday morning. Uh, so you're thinking, okay, well, what's, what's he talking about? Well, clearly the Lord wants you here because we all need it has to be done cheerfully. The church was a rich gentleman who was known to be worth about 50,000 pounds. Now, this story obviously is old, but he is known by everybody in the church to be a very, very wealthy person. But he's also a very stingy person, like most of us are. And a deacon came to him and asked, he said, Brother, how much are you going to give for the construction of the new church? And the Scot replied, oh, I guess I'll be able to put in the widow's might. So the deacon called out in the next meeting, brethren, we have all the money we need 
this brother is going to give 50,000 pounds. <laughs> and the man was amazed. And he looks at him, he says, I didn't say I would give 50,000 pounds. I said I would give the widow's might. And the deacon replied, well, she gave all. And I thought that is what you meant to give. <laughs> it is interesting that God notes what you give, but also what you keep for yourself. So here's a challenge for all of us. Explore ways that you might link up with a ministry outside of your city, either through your church or through a Christian organization, by joining with other believers to do God's work. You increase Christian unity and help the kingdom grow. Now, I can tell you that for us, uh, we have a meeting once a month, and a certain amount of money has been allocated, and it is set aside, and it is known that these funds are going to be used for ministry. And so every week we sit down and we go, okay, who, who is in need of this money? We'll pray about it. We'll say, Lord, where, where would you like these funds to go this week, this month? And, you know, it's, 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 it's neat to see the way that God prompts who in that moment might be in need financially. And so we will just send a check and um, we don't ask for anything. We don't want anything. Uh, if we could send it in cash so that even nobody even knew it was us, that would be fantastic. But to me, that's, that's the structure. We, we, we budgeted this amount. Now, you can give more than that, but you can't give less because you made a commitment to the Lord. And you said, Lord, every week as you are blessing me out of your abundance, I'm going to bless your ministry out of what you've given me. So it's not just about supporting our local church, which is good, but other ministries are in need of support as well. You know, I've numerous times called you guys to support He's the Solution Ministries as we uh, purchase Bibles and send them out all over the country and um, give out tracts and, and devotionals for our, uh, our weekday or our weekend uh, Bible studies during our funding tours. Uh, and many of you have been very faithful in doing that. And I just want to say thank you uh, for your offerings and your support of He's the Solution Ministries, which, by the way, quick caveat, side note here, uh, Jerry Strack sent me an email last week, and uh, he said, Lee, it's October, and it's actually October 10th. Uh, so tomorrow will be the 12th anniversary of. He's the Solution Ministry. So it was October 11th that we had our first He's the Solution uh, Ministries Sunday morning service. And it was, I believe, Jerry and Dana Claft. It was the three of us. <laughs> and 12 years later, here we are. You know, and it's just, it's, it's amazing to see what the Lord has done and what he's doing. And uh, it's just, it's just a privilege to be a part of it. So thank you. To everyone for your support of this ministry, it is it is greatly appreciated. In another church, they were taking up an offering for a building program, and the man calling on one of the members said to him, "He said, how much, brother, are you going to give for the new building?" And the man said, "Well, I guess I could give ten dollars and not feel it." And the man replied, "Then why don't you make it twenty dollars?" and feel it. You see, the blessing only comes when we feel it. This is the meaning of it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Now, the widow's might, she gave that was the word that she wasn't hoarding these, these two mites, which is one eighth of a penny it's so insignificant. But to her, it was everything she had. I mean, those two mites could have been before she was completely out of money. And yet she chose to give them to the ministry because her faith was such that she knew she could give 
joyfully and the Lord would continue to bless her. And so that's what she did. Now, Paul says that the grace which motivated the Macedonians should be the same grace that would motivate the Corinthians. The real test of any person lies in what he gives. Someone said there are three books that are essential for a worship service. The first book is the Bible. The second book is the hymn book. And the third book is the pocket book. Giving is a part of our worship to God. If you do not have the grace of giving, you should pray to God and ask him to give us a generous sharing spirit. Because the pocket book is really the test of a man's love. It is the most sensitive area of a Christian, giving. You know, years ago, I was challenged about my, my time commitment to the Lord. And so I was challenged to look at my calendar. And through my calendar, I could determine if my time was focused on the things of the world or if my time was focused on the things of the Lord. So if you look at somebody's calendar and you, you know, you see that church attendance occurs on Easter Sunday and Christmas Eve then there's a real strong argument to be made that they're not really living for the Lord because they're not prioritizing him as part of their schedule. Well, I was challenged in the same way a little later about my giving. If I were to look at your checkbook register, would I see a life devoted to self, and one's own interest and pleasures and enjoyment? Or would I see somebody who is devoted to the Lord's work based on which checks had been written to who and for the amounts that had been written? Again, grace. We have grace. So you do not need to feel in any way. You do not need to be listening to this and, and feel like you are in trouble or that you have failed or that you're not doing enough because that's between you and the Lord. However, the real test of any person lies in what he gives. Now, if we do not have the grace of giving, we should pray to God and ask him to give us a generous sharing spirit. Have you ever prayed that? Lord, I pray that you would give me a generous, sharing spirit. Lord, give me a desire to give. Give me, a, uh, uh, give me a, an understanding of what the needs are. Lord, reveal to me who is in need and, and where you would have me to direct these funds that belong to you. And Lord, show me what it is you would have me to do with them in Jesus' name. Right? Pretty simple prayer. Now, there's, there's a number of ways to look at it. Does God look to you to give out of what he's given you? And so now you're trying to allocate 10%. Or do we consider that God has given you control of 90% of his money, which you are to be a good steward over, but you need to give him back the 10%. So whose money is it? You know, my son Harrison said, you know, Dad, it's not your money. I said, really? It's not whose is it? He says, it's, it's, it's God's money. It's just your time to use it. So true. It's just our time to use it. Is it really your money? And I think that that's one of the ways that we can become more generous is to change our perspective of whose money it is. There's not a single thing that I have that is mine. Everything I have belongs to the Lord. It's, it's his, and it's up to him to do with it what he would have done. And if he wants a thousand dollars to go over there, then that's where it's going to go. And if he wants 500 bucks to go over there, then that's where it's going to go. And if he wants more to go that direction, then that's where it's going to go. And I, I just pray that it is in cheerfulness that we are giving, not out of obligation. So do not feel 
okay, he reached out, Lee taught us about, you know, giving. So I guess I better go to the He's the Solution donate just so we can, get, we can get them off my back. Well, this is not from me. <laughs> this is from the Lord. This is from the Lord. And if the Lord is prompting your heart to give, then give. And, and if you feel he isn't, then don't. It, it must be done joyfully. Verse 6 of chapter 8. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in, sp in faith and speech and knowledge and complete earnestness and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. Now, what Paul is saying here is that the Corinthian believers excelled at everything. They had faith. They had great preaching. They had the significant knowledge. They had much earnestness. They had much love. But Paul also wanted them to be leaders in giving. Paul's point is that giving is a natural response of love. Paul did not order the Corinthians to give but he encourages them to prove that their love was sincere. Because when you love someone, you want to give him or her your time and attention and to provide for his or her needs. If you refuse to help, your love is not as genuine as you say. Now, you know, let's Christmas, only 11 weeks away, FYI. Christmas is just around the corner. And as we start to think about the people that we are going to buy presents for, do we think about these people as a, oh, it's almost Christmas time. Oh, I just love the season. I just love giving gifts to people. And I can't wait to buy this gift for so-and-so. And I can't wait to buy this gift for so-and-so. And I can't wait to buy this gift for so-and-so. And I can't wait to watch them open it up under the tree. And, and it's going to be a beautiful Christmas morning. And they're, you know, the kids and the grandkids, they're going to be so thrilled with this present, right? And so we go shopping joyously. But then we get invited to that one Christmas party where there's going to be a lot of friends and family that you haven't seen for a while and you're not really close and everybody's bringing a present. So you've got to bring a present because if you don't, it's going to look bad. And, you know, we, we've got to save face with this side of the family. You know, it's his side, it's her side. And so we reluctantly and begrudgingly go down and we buy, you know, the first $10 gift we can find on the, on the clearance rack, or we swing by the dollar store on the way there because we got to bring something. Do you see the difference in, in, in emotional joy about the giving? Which is why giving is really a matter of the heart, because if we are grudgingly giving, do we really love the person that we're giving it to? Now, that could be the problem, right? When we give, we might be looking and going, you know what? I don't know why we're giving so much money to this, this church. The pastor doesn't seem to do anything with it. I never see anything you know, new at the church. I'm not seeing, you know, any new employees. I'm not seeing any new structures. I'm not seeing any new programs. I'm not seeing any new converts. I'm not seeing any growth. So I'm not going to support this ministry because clearly this pastor does not know how to be a good steward of these funds. So I'm going to direct them over here. And I'm going to continue going to that church because I like the people and there's some cool programs that I like to participate in throughout the year. But you know what? I just don't trust that group or that individual to manage my money appropriately. Therefore, I'm not going to give. Okay. Well, now we've recognized what the problem is. The problem is we are giving to men when we are tithing or when we are blessing others financially. Therein lies the grudging emotional state. We're, we aren't giving to the Lord. You see, we, we have to make that transition. 
When you donate to He's the Solution Ministries, you're not giving money to Lee Arnold so that Lee Arnold can go, you know, spend your money. No, you're giving money to the Lord. That's the Lord's work. A ministry exists, at least it should exist, to share Christ with others. And so when we are giving financially, we are giving money to the Lord so that his message can be spread. His gospel can be shared. His word, the Bible, can be given out. So we have to think of who we're giving to, not what. The who is Jesus Christ. The one who came down from heaven, left his, his kingly throne at the right hand of the Father, and he comes to the planet Earth poor and dies on a cross for you and me so that we can spend eternity in heaven. And we can willfully and cheerfully give him a $50 bill, a $100 bill, $200 bill. But see, this again goes back to the importance of the budgeting for this because if we are not giving out of intention then every time we do give it's happening out of expectation oh pastor church on giving today i guess we better you know put a little bit more in this sunday no the message should not change the 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 commitment again we, we allocate 43% of our income for housing. We allocate 12% of our income for, for automobiles and transportation. We allocate 20% of our budget for food. We, have, we allocate 10% for travel and, and entertainment. Why don't we have a ministry allocation? Why don't we have a, we're giving 10%, we're giving 12%, we're giving 15%. And it's going to happen every two weeks, faithfully. Then, you don't ever have to come to a second Corinthians chapter eight, and chapter nine, and sit through it and feel guilty. Like you're getting called out because you haven't been as faithful in your giving as you could have been. Again, we have grace. This is between you and the Lord, but between you and the Lord, what's the commitment? Verse nine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Now, there's no evidence that Jesus was any poorer than most first century Palestinians. Rather, Jesus became poor by giving up his rights as God and becoming human. Born in a borrowed cradle, Jesus preaches from a borrowed boat. He rode into Jerusalem on a borrowed donkey, and he ate his last supper in a borrowed room. He was buried in a borrowed grave. He made everything. He who made everything laid it all down and entered into total poverty that we might be rich rich spiritually, rich in the promise of an eternity in heaven with him. Jesus took on total and complete poverty and death so that we could be rich, not with dollars, but rich in the love of Jesus, rich in the fact that if you have invited him to your heart and made him your Lord and Savior, that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. God's down payment on your future eternity is in you if you know Jesus. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. He became poor so that we could become rich. Shouldn't our giving be out of absolute joy and appreciation for what he's done and what we have because of him? If you are looking for a standard for giving, here it is. The Lord Jesus Christ himself was rich and he became poor. He came down here. He took a place of poverty. 
Imagine leaving heaven and coming down to this earth to be born in an animal barn in Jerusalem, laid as a baby in a horse trough where they fed and watered the animals, to live in a run-down, scummy city called Nazareth, and to die on a cross outside the walls of Jerusalem, and to be put into the darkness of a tomb. He was rich, but he became poor for you and me. So the question is, do we give this selflessly? Verse 10, and here about, about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you only, but also to have the to now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. The Corinthian church had money, and apparently they had, they had planned to collect money for the Jerusalem churches a year previously. So Paul challenged the, challenges them to act on their plans. Now, four principles of giving emerge here from these verses. Number one, your willingness to give cheerfully is more important than the amount you give. So if you know that you could give $1,000, but you couldn't do it and not feel concerned, then don't give $1,000. Give $1. So principle number one, the heart with which you give is more important than the amount. So am I giving happily, cheerfully, joyfully? Lord, here's, here's 10 bucks, Lord. I'm so excited to be able to give this to you. Or, Lord, here's, here's a check for $100. Take it. Take it quick. Take it. The Lord would rather have the $10. Principle number two. You should strive to fulfill your financial commitments. So again, we make financial commitments to our mortgage company, to our cell phone company, to our insurance company, to our utility company. How much of a financial commitment have we made to God? Number three, if you give to others in need, they will in turn help you when you are in need. And finally, number four, you should give as a response to Christ, not for anything you can get out of it. So we should not be giving to get. Our giving should not be for leverage on something else down the road. Well, I'm giving because I get this. Now, there are large sects and large uh, churches who have a something called a temple recommend. And every year you have to meet with them and they will look at your tax returns and they will look at your bottom line. And then they will look to see if your charitable giving is at least 10% of your bottom line. And if it is not, you will lose your ability to go into the temple. Well, what happened to grace? Because grace says to give cheerfully, joyfully. Now I know people who go to this religious cult sect, and there's no joy. I mean, it is out of absolute obligation that they're giving, because if they don't give, it's proverbial egg on your face, and if you can't go to the temple, then you're not going to be able to go see somebody get married, and, and you know, at no point in time did God institute such rigor in accounting for what somebody else is giving. That's, that's not for men to decide. You know, and if you are attending a church where they are checking to make sure you are giving the right amount, I would say that that church is out of line in, as to what the Bible says. We are no longer under law. Under law, we are under grace. So the Old Testament stipulation for the tithe, no longer valid. 
So if your church is like literally, you know, calculating and tallying and sharing with others and showing you, hey, you've only given this much this year. You better step it up, brother. You better get, sister, hey, you better get to work here. Not seeing enough money coming in. That is so not biblically based. And if they're not biblically based on giving, I would begin to question whether or not everything else that they're teaching is biblically based or not. It's not up to us, you guys, to police the giving of the saints. That is between you and the Lord. So how do you decide how much to give? Verse 12. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable. According to what one has, not according to what he does not have. So how do you know how much to give? What about the difference in the financial resources between one Christian or another? Well, Paul is in the church here for to follow. Here are the principles. Number one, a person should follow through on previous classes. If you told the church that you were going to donate $5,000 from the refinance of your house or from the sale of this thing to support the building of the thing, then you need to give it. You made a commitment. You need to follow through. If you at one point went to a concert where at the back of the table they had you know, the, the Compass International things where you can uh, you can donate and support a child and you need to send them $45 a month, every month. You know, if you made that commitment, then you need to continue to make that commitment. Oh, well, Lee, you don't understand, you know, we, we, did, our, we did our numbers and uh, we just can't financially afford the $45 anymore. Okay. I have a feeling though, if I were, look, if I were to look at your bank balance, I would probably see Popcorn, movie, coffee, Starbucks, McDonald's, right? So there's always a way to financially afford giving to God's work. But yeah, we might have to make some sacrifices over here. And I believe that that's where the blessing comes, right? It's through those sacrifices over here so that we can give here that we really begin to get blessed. So we must follow through on previous promises made. Secondly, each person should give as much as he or she is able. Number three, each person must make up his or her own mind on how much to give. And each person should give in proportion to what God has given him or her. God gives to us so that we can give to others. Lord, prayed a young man, I'm going to start a business, and of whatever money it makes, I will keep 10% and give you 90%. The person's name was Henry Parson Crowell, founder of the Quaker Oats Company. He kept his word and died a wealthy man, even though he gave nine cents of every dime to the Lord. Now, if you've never read his story, you got to just Google it. Not now, but when we get done, Google Henry Parson Crowell, Quaker Oats Company. Just an incredible story. And it is because of this man that Moody Bible Institute still exists because Dwight L. Moody was preaching when Henry Parson Crowell came to know the Lord. So as he says that prayer, he says, Lord, if you'll help me be successful, I will give 90% of everything I earn back to you. And I will figure out how to live on 10%. And when he died, he was so wealthy that he couldn't even give away the 10%. Paul says that we should give out of what we have, not what we don't have. Sacrificial giving must be responsible. Paul wants believers to give generally. Paul wants believers to give generously, but not to the extent that those who depend on the givers, i.e. their families, for example, must go without having their basic needs met. 
give until it hurts, but don't give so that it hurts your family or relatives who need your financial support. Now, here again is an area where I believe some of these people on TV, some of these evangelists, some of these churches, they have gone way over the line. And they're saying things like, you got to trust God. And instead of, you know, paying that mortgage payment, you should send it here to us and we'll send you this handkerchief that has, you know, the, the tears of Paul on it. And, and, and God will bless you abundantly. So don't pay your mortgage. Don't pay this. Don't pay that. Send it all to the church and watch God provide. But God did provide. He provided you the money to pay the mortgage. He provided you the money to make the car payment. He provided you the money to do that. Do that, do that. So we need to pay for the things that we have made commitments to. Mortgage, groceries, kids, right? Kids, you know, not cheap. So we're not to give out of the things that we need to support our families and to support our financial obligations. We need to be good stewards of what God has given us and what we have made commitments to financially. So we're not giving that to the Lord. That's what he's given us to live on. But what we are giving to the Lord is the things that we, the, the income we don't need. That's what we're going to give to the Lord. Paul gives the example, verse 15, he says, as it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, but he who gathered little did not have too little. Now, what Paul's referring to here is when the children of Israel were wandering in the desert for 40 years, and God would bring manna to them every morning. So he brought them manna every morning. He brought them quail every evening. But you were only to eat what would fill you up. You were not to store it up. Each was to gather enough for one day. Now, some man might go out with several baskets and say, let's just fill them up. I'll gather bushel baskets of manna while I can. And he would go out and greedily gather up much more than he needed. And what would happen? Well, after he had eaten what he needed for the day, he would find that all the rest had spoiled the next morning. Now, it was God's plan that each one should have just enough and no more. Now, in verse 9, chapter 9, verse 6, fast forward, it says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. I think that God will begin to deal with you as you have been dealing with him. I honestly think that God keeps books. Now, he does not put us under law because he wants our giving to be a grace, a passion, a desire to share. It should be a joyful experience, but I believe that our expected blessings are a result of our joyful givings. And if there's no joyful giving, then we shouldn't have any blessing expectations. Now, what about the person who lives at the top or even above their means, which means I have you know, I, I'm in a house that we could barely afford. I'm driving a car because I wanted the nicer, newer car, and we can barely afford it. And, and at the end of the month, there just isn't any surplus. There's nothing left. So I don't have anything to get. All right. Well, I hate to tell you this, but I truly believe that you will continue to struggle financially. You will continue to live paycheck to paycheck because you did not choose to sacrifice the nicer things. And instead of the nicer home, you went for the lower price home so that your budget and your finances would still have enough left over for the Lord's things. Because now we've overspent. We've spent more than we had. And now we're scrambling every month to try to make ends meet. And we don't have anything left to give to the Lord. 
I would encourage you to sell the house you can't afford, sell the house, sell the car you can't afford, and get your budget and your income in line so that you do have money to give to the Lord. You want to see your life blessed so incredibly out of control abundantly? Live a life of mediocrity. Live a life of poverty. Even if you can make millions, live, live impoverished so you can give more. Now, again, just my opinion, your giving is 100% between you and the Lord. And guys, if you do it, nothing drives me crazier than the person. So why is selling your house? Well, you know, we, we just felt the Lord tugging on our heart that we needed to, you know, reduce our expenses so that we would have more money so that we could give more money to the church. Okay, well, guess what? You just got your blessing. If we're seeking the praise and the accolades of men, and we are doing things intentionally on earth to impress everybody else on earth, then your reward comes from the people on earth. And I will tell you this, I do not want rewards from anybody on this planet. I only want rewards from the Lord. But how do we ensure that the rewards come from the Lord and not from others around us? We do things privately. We don't, you know, we don't bring in a, a wad of bills wrapped with a thousand dollar band and, and make sure that everybody sees it when we drop it in the bucket. That's not blessing, okay? That is not giving joyfully to the Lord. That is giving so that others will see, oh my goodness, what a generous person. Oh, praise them, praise them. They're so incredible, right? So, this, this whole idea of piety for praise, I'm going to present low-profile, humble persona, let everybody know and make sure they know that I, I do this so that I can give more to the Lord. Those kind of people drive me crazy because it's like, why are you telling me this? <laughs> this is really none of my business. This is the Lord. And if the Lord has encouraged you to do that, then praise the Lord. But that's between you and him. I don't need to be involved in this conversation. I'm thrilled you're giving. That's great. Great. Praise the Lord. But don't tell me. Don't want to know. It's between you and him. Verse 16. I thank God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal. But he is coming to you with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. And we are sending along with him the brother who is praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel. So here we see Titus and his companion had this grace in their heart. The giving was to be for the glory of God. And whatever we give should be for the glory of God. So they are going to now dis distribute the gift. Verse 19, what is more... He was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering, which we administer in order to honor the Lord himself and to show our eagerness to help. Verse 20, we want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift. Now, again, this is one of the more sensitive areas of the Lord's work. Many Christian organizations and churches major in heavy promotion to encourage giving to a certain work. No effort, or at best little effort, is made to tell how the money is used. There should be the representation of tangible evidence that the money is used to give out the word of God and that there are results that can be documented, not just isolated cases. There should be confidence in the organization to which we give that it is honest and it is operated in the highest of integrity. You know, before we just pick up the phone and call and give $1,000 to the really shiny guy on TV in the, the nice suit, you know, telling us how much the Lord needs our money, we need to be researching that organization. We need to be making sure that where the money is going is, in fact, being used for the Lord's work. Now, some would say, well, you know, the Lord can take care of himself. Well, true, true that. 
but we still need to be good stewards and we need to make sure that if we're giving money to these ministries, if we're giving money to these organizations, that the money is indeed being used for the Lord's work and not just to buy the, the fancy shiny guy on TV, a new Rolls Royce or to fly him around on a private jet. Is it really being used for the Lord's things? We should not support an organization about which we have doubts. We must remember that this is a big, bad world and that there are religious racketeers in it. And we need to be aware. Even Paul, this great apostle, says, providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men, it should be obvious that the money is used for the purpose for which it is given. Verse 21, for we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but in the eyes of men. Okay, this is Paul saying to the church, hey, know that when you give, I'm going to do everything I can to protect your gift and to make sure that it is distributed appropriately to the people for which it was intended. And that's, that's just sound doctrine to make sure that the funds are being used appropriately. You know, does your church where you're going, do they have disclosure? Do they open up the budget to the congregants? Are you able to see where the money is going? Now, some churches aren't, you know what? I'm the pastor. Uh, the Lord has put me in this position. You need to trust that the pastor is doing what is right before the Lord. You know, and I don't really have a strong opinion either way, because I've seen churches that, you know, everything's out in the open, front and center for all to see. And other times the, the church is run through a board or a board of deacons, and those decisions are made by the people on that board. So if you have any doubts as to whether or not your funds are being allocated appropriately, I believe that as a member of that church or an attendee of that congregation, that you have every right to ask, hey, where are we at financially? And if God has placed that on your heart, finances and administration could very well be your calling. And maybe that's where God is calling you to serve in the church. If you don't know what your calling is, I, I heard this years and years ago, and I never forgot it. If you don't know what your calling is, walk into a brand new church. Just, you know, Skip a Sunday at your normal church, walk into a brand new church, one you've never attended before. Walk in and take note of your thoughts and your emotions as you go through it. And if you don't like the way that you were greeted, then your calling is to the greeting, the greeters ministry. Or you walk in and the, the sound mix is just off and you can tell that they didn't blend the guitars well enough with the keys and it's just a muddy mess. Maybe your gift is to be on the soundboard. The audio visual is your calling. Or if you come in and you, you say, boy, you know, I wish the pastor maybe would have said this or maybe said it differently. Or and I, I really feel like if, it, if he would have said it that way, it could have been, uh, it could have been more, more interesting or, or more useful. All right. Maybe God is calling you to teach or to preach. Wherever we are the most critical is usually where we are gifted because that's the way we think. So if we go in and think, you know, What's this church doing? Hey, you know, financially, we could be doing so much more. All right. Well, maybe you should be on the board of that church. I don't know. What's God calling you to? Again, that's between you and him. Verse 22. In addition, we are sending with them our brother who has often proved to us in many ways that he is zealous. And now even more so because of the great confidence in you. As for Titus, he is my partner. And fellow worker among you, as for our brothers, they are representatives of the churches and an honor to Christ. They can trust Titus, Paul says. He will make a good report. They can trust Paul, who will also report to them. The money will not be delivered by just one person. And that is something we all should be mindful of. There needs to be more than one person handling the finances of the church, of the ministry, 
There should be multiple people. There should be multiple checks and balances because ultimate power corrupts, corrupts ultimately. And if there is no checks and balances and review of the funds, then that needs to be corrected because we cannot have God's funds being misappropriated. Paul explains here in these verses that by traveling together, there could be no suspicion of people, no suspicion, and people would know that the gift was being handled honestly. The church did not need to worry that the bearers of the collection would misuse the money. And that's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, brethren, give generously. Give out of your poverty. Give out of your abundance. Because there's going to be several of us coming to pick up the gift, and it will be taken care of, and it will be administered correctly. Verse 24. Therefore, show these men the proof of your love and the reason for our pride in you, so that the churches can see it. Paul is asking for proof of their love. You see, friend, if you really mean business, there will be more than words. Giving will be a tangible expression of your love. Verse 24, therefore, show these men the proof of your love by giving. I'm afraid there are a great many Christians who are like the young fellow who wrote to his sweetheart. He said, honey, I would cross the widest ocean for you. I'd swim the deepest river for you. I would scale the highest mountain for you. I'd crawl across the burning sands of the desert for you. Then he concluded with a P.S. If it doesn't rain Wednesday night, I'll come see you. Unfortunately, great many of us like to talk about how we love Jesus, but we're not willing to sacrifice much for him. Paul is urging the Corinthians to show the proof of their love. And I believe that through our study this morning, we are being encouraged to show the proof of our love by being faithful givers by budgeting the gift, by budgeting the amount every single week and biweekly pay period and month and quarter and year that we are going to faithfully, cheerfully give to the Lord. In closing, George Washington Carver wisely said, how far you go in life depends on your being tender with the young they have a greater longing for the coming of the kingdom of god and as a result tend to release their finances more easily indeed statistics bear out that the fact that it is the poor segment of any congregation that supports the ministry of the church at Philip, Paul said, although they were in great affliction, they shared out of their poverty. The results, Paul's letter to the Philippians is one of the most joyous of all of his letters. So how do we keep from becoming small, harsh, and caught up in our own little materialistic world by giving. Giving is a privilege and a joy, a fact proven conclusively by the Philippians. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The pathway to fellowship is often through the pocketbook because our money is representative of our time and our energy. Therefore, when you give a check to a brother or sister or a ministry, you're actually giving a part of your life. Thus, the most practical way of laying down your life, as Jesus did for us, is to give out of your life financially. Dwight L. Moody said, the world is yet to see what God can do with and for and through and in 
a man or a woman who is fully and wholly consecrated to him. Guys, if you're not giving consistently, regularly, joyfully, cheerfully, you are missing out on a huge part of the joy and the blessing and the privilege of being a Christian and of walking with the Lord. Give. Budget for it. Plan for it. Look forward to it. But do it privately. It's between you and the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your reminder to each one of us this morning. And Lord, I know that some here give abundantly. They give joyously. And Lord, for those, this is just a reminder about the privilege we have to give. And Lord, the opportunity that you give us to, to share what you have so abundantly given to us. So Lord, thank you for this reminder that giving is a privilege. Lord, for others here this morning, this message has been hard because they know they've not been faithful to your call to give. And Lord, it's, it's not easy to be corrected. It's not easy to be um, instructed on the things we should be doing and haven't been. But Lord, I pray that this morning might be a, a, a new day for those listening. And Lord, that they would make giving a priority, that they would make giving something that happens every week or biweekly. Lord, it's just, it's just part of their budget. And that they would do that cheerfully and joyfully. Lord, I just pray for those folks here today that this was a, a difficult message to hear. And Lord, for those that heard today's message and thought, well, I give enough. Lord, I pray that you just soften their hearts to see that there is so much more. So much more opportunity to share. So much more opportunity to be a blessing. So many areas that that the, the church and various ministries need financial assistance. But I pray that you would soften their hearts. Help them to understand that everything they have is yours. And giving any portion of it back to you, Lord, is a privilege and it's an honor. So Lord, I thank you that you allow us to serve in this way. Lord, help, our, help us to separate ourselves from our money. And to recognize, Lord, that it's not ours. It's all yours. And help us to be faithful and loving and cheerful stewards of what is yours. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Not sure what the Lord wants each of us to do with that message, but I know that uh, he will show us through the prompt of spirit. So uh, be in prayer about that. Reminder, Be Bold Conference, October 22nd, 23rd, 24th, it's coming up and seats are selling quickly. So I really, 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 really would love to see all of you there. Um, so I'm, I'm praying that you guys can make the journey, that you can travel, that you can be physically present because uh, we get to spend every Sunday morning together in a two-dimensional world called Zoom, but I'd love to spend time with you three-dimensionally at the Be Bold for Jesus conference. So if you're not registered yet, please do so. Go to beboldforjesus.org, tickets.beboldforjesus.org, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all there. Uh, if anybody needs prayer, we'd love to pray with you. Uh, you can give us a call on our prayer line at 800-461-0216. Again, 800-461-0216. Well, until next Sunday, if we're still here, Lord willing, God bless you guys. Have a tremendous week. We'll see you soon. Goodbye, everybody.